Good morning, everyone. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and we are happy to gather and worship together as the church. Uh, Carla will begin us with some announcements, and then we will begin our worship service together. Good morning. morning. I feel like I haven't been here in forever, so it's great to be here, and it's lovely to see all of you. I do have a few announcements to get started this morning. Some of them Actually, most of them are in your bulletin if you'd like to follow along. As always, if you have joys or concerns, please send them to Pastor Scott. He'll take an email, phone call, text, uh, or you can certainly call Helen, Helen Henley to get that out to the congregation via our prayer chain. Sunday school is still meeting at 9 a.m.-ish in the parlor. Uh, still doing Revelation? We are still doing Revelation. It takes a while. But there's, been, there's a lot that's being revealed to us. So, Ooh, um, how relevating. We are revelating in <laughs> revelations. Uh, if you don't believe me, talk to Donna or Danny um, uh, or Sue, who's been joining us. We, we've uh, encountered God in a lot of ways and a lot of different enlightenment through the verses. So uh, please join us on any Sunday, and I promise you will be blessed. The craft ministry has decided to take the summer off which is well-deserved, and, oops, sorry, what? Hey, tech team, (laughs) they're working on it. (laughs) I will speak louder. (laughs) So the craft ministry has decided to take the summer off, so don't look for them uh, until the fall. They will start again on on Wednesday nights. Uh, Sorry, again in the fall on Tuesdays, right? Okay. Um, We are still doing our Wednesday night community prayer at 7 p.m. If you need a card with that prayer on it, they are still available, will be available. Just, I think they're out in the Narthex or see Pastor Scott. Upcoming uh, on June 11th from 2 to 4 p.m., there will be the Memorial Open House for Dottie Seaver. So make sure you put that on your calendars upcoming this week. So that'll be down in the community room. Uh, you can show up anytime between 2 to 4. I know at right about 3 o'clock we're going to say some words and, and Howard might say some words uh, about Dottie. So it's not going to be a, a traditional uh, service, so to speak, but more of an open house. Uh, so come and visit with Howard anytime between 2 to 4. And also uh, Friday morning, June the 10th, uh, Bob Mendenhall passed away this week. Um, and I will be getting details for you, but at some point on June the 10th, not here, but there will be a service, so I'll get those details out to you as well for that. As Pastor Scott mentioned, today is Pentecost Sunday, so the altar cloths have been changed to red. See? Um, And it represents the beginning of the Christian church, and it reminds us how Jesus promised that God would send the Holy Spirit, that the promise to send the Holy Spirit was fulfilled. And finally, the altar flowers this morning um, are in celebration of Rondi, 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 Ron and Sandy Hankel's 55th wedding anniversary. This is not an easy job. If anybody wants to come up here, I'm just volunteer. So happy wedding anniversary. And also... There we go. Bring us summer barbecue you know, something to share, and we will commune and fellowship after church next Sunday. Any other announcements for the good of the church? All right. Uh, then I turn it over to Scott. was our annual conference, which was done virtually, and there's not a whole lot to report. Um, a majority of it was just normal business, approving the finances and all of that stuff. Uh, They did have a vote in the West Ohio Conference to go from eight conferences, or eight districts, down to six. So, uh, which kind of makes it a little more difficult because there's a bigger burden on each of the district superintendents. I'm personally not in favor of that, Um, but that was voted on. Uh, There were three other issues, big issues that were on, uh, that either did not pass or were tabled. Um, and some of that was regarding to uh, disfiliation, the, the ability for churches to disfiliate from uh, the United Methodist Church. 
um, and uh, the others was to recognize uh, or acknowledge um, uh, clergy um, uh, that were homosexual. So um, nothing really passed. If you want any more details, I'll be happy to give them to you. Uh, you can also find any information in summary or the Episcopal address. Uh, the video of that uh, is available online through the West Ohio uh, website. So if you have any interest in more details or that information, call me, text me, email me, whatever. I'll be happy to share that with you. Um, I spent two days watching on the computer and, well, it was two days of my time gone. <laughs> so, uh, But it's important business. Uh, there was a lot of stuff that was discussed, a lot of important things, but nothing was resolved, uh, so there's not a whole lot to report. Um, and uh, uh, the general conference is still postponed to 2024, and annual conference next year will be in person, uh, but they're moving it to Otterbein College and not back to um, Lakeside, uh, which is disappointing because we love Lakeside. So. Uh, but I'll, I'll have more information for anybody who's interested in that. And then we will be having some community forums here uh, talking about what's going on with the uh, likely split in the United Methodist Church. So uh, just be aware that I'm, I'm on top of it and the issues that are going on. There's a lot of things that are being resolved by the Judicial Council. And so we're kind of in a holding pattern right now. Uh, but we'll continue to talk about that because in the next year or two, uh, this congregation will have to make some important decisions uh, about where it stands with United Methodist Church or not with the United Methodist Church. So that is all the announcements that I have. Are there any other announcements for the good of the church? Oh, no. I'll, I'll, when I get the communion, we'll talk. We're not on the same page today. Which is surprising because we spent a lot of time unusually together the last two days. Um, so it's been a blessing, but we'd think we'd be on a closer page with each other. So, But that's okay. So we are good. We are ready for worship. So if you would please stand uh, and join us for the call to worship. And just remember, with it being Pentecost Sunday, Pentecost is all about the presence of the Holy Spirit. So uh, just release yourselves and be ready to feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. Please join me in the call to worship. Teach me, Lord, the way of your decree, that I may follow it to the end. Give me understanding so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. How I long for your precepts. In your righteous, pre preserve my life.
take this time to share the love and peace of Jesus Christ with one another.
I wouldn't share that we, I wouldn't say that we were actually sharing the peace in our conversation, but I was, I was giving more details to those who had questions about annual conference, and I will take time afterwards. Um, I can stay for a little bit right after church. Uh, if you've got specific questions, I can go into more detail um, about them. Uh, so if you, if you do have questions, so um, I think it just is a, a, one of our concerns is, is to pray for uh, the United Methodist Church um, because um, I love being a pastor. I do not love the politics of being a pastor. Um, I, Carla has told me from day one, you need to get more involved and you get more involved. And the closer I get to it, the more I hate it. <laughs> and because it is politics and it's about people and pride and politics and not about truly about God's word and the Holy Spirit uh, that it should be. And unfortunately in our denomination, it is, it is dysfunctional um, and there is not unity. We are not a United Methodist Church right now. Um, we do not have equal accountability in the discipline, and it is uh, at times very frustrating uh, for me. So, uh, so, but our church deserves prayers, and and that that we, uh, I believe, are beyond the point of reconciliation, and that that we would be a healthier church uh, to allow churches. Uh, to, to leave and serve God in the way that they feel called. And I have no objections to uh, what other people's beliefs are and how they choose to worship God uh, because I want the freedom to worship God in the way that I choose. And I've chosen uh, Wesleyan theology for a reason, and I've chosen the United Methodist Church for a reason. Uh, but at this point, I'm also uh, thoroughly dissatisfied for a reason. So if you have specific questions, uh, about that, and I will try to be as honest and unbiased about both sides as I can for you, because I want you to have uh, uh, a complete understanding, and, um, and in no way do I want anybody to feel that my personal beliefs will make me think anything less of you if your personal beliefs are different than mine, because it's okay. I'm okay if you don't agree with me, and I'm okay if you don't have to share the same beliefs, but we need to be able to have a healthy and respectful conversation about what that means not only to our individual lives but to us as a collective congregation because the health of this congregation is dependent just like our our, our sermons that, that we've been doing through Ephesians it depends on our unity and we cannot faithfully go make disciples of Christ if we are not unified in our beliefs in God the Holy Spirit his son Jesus Christ and his holy word those are things that we need to be unified on for us to be effective in our witness and our discipleship. And to me, those are some very core beliefs. Um, and I think there are some things that, that we will have to face and resolve within our church and our congregation and also within the greater United Methodist Church. So there's, there's a lot of things at play here. And for me, there's a lot of things that are at play that are greater than politics. And it has to come down to what we truly believe is our foundation as a church. So just uh, keep all of that in your prayers. Uh, each and every week, it is a um, it, it is a grieving process for a lot of people because for some people, they've been part of like for some of you like have five, six, seven generations of family that were in this particular church, even though it wasn't always a Methodist church. Uh, but you love your congregation, and for a lot of people, for their congregation to not be what they want it to be theologically is hard for them. Some people want it to change, some people want it to stay the same, some people want to compromise, and it's, it's a very difficult situation. So just be in prayers for that. Um, of course, we want to acknowledge the joy of Sandy and Ron's uh, 55th uh, wedding anniversary. Uh, that is a, uh, a great milestone, um, and so um, uh, great joys uh, for that. Um, we also this week learned of uh, the passing of Bob Mendenhall, uh, who was, is the brother of Jeannie DeMoss, and uh, their family grew up in the church. Uh, her sister Peggy just passed away a few months ago uh, as well, but Bob's been in, in poor health. Uh, so like I said, when I have the details of that uh, service, I will let you know. 
Also, uh, we found out this morning that Amy Reese's father uh, passed away. So be in prayers for Amy and her family uh, this week. It's um, uh, been a difficult road um, for her as a caretaker for both her mom and her father. And uh, I know she's very close to both of them. So uh, continued prayers for that. Uh, continue to pray for uh, Kay Argo. Um, she is uh, continuing to recover, but she's got a couple other issues and tests that she's going to go through this week to try to resolve the rest of her problems. So continue to pray uh, for Kay. Um, and then um, also a, a friend of ours, uh, Leslie Schultz, uh, just recently had a, a pacemaker put in. Uh, a second pacemaker, right? Her second pacemaker, her first one replaced uh, with a new pacemaker, but she's having some complications with the incisions and some other things. So prayers for Leslie Schultz um, on that. And uh, I think that is all the joys and concerns that I'm aware of at this time. Are there any additional joys and concerns we'd like to share or updates on existing ones? Marty? So that, that was a friend of your granddaughter? So friend of Marty Krause's uh, granddaughter was in a major uh, car accident, and they were not wearing seat belts, and they're in, in bad shape. So prayers for them. Sandy? Yes. So Mike White, who uh, Sandy shared with us last week, was in a terrible motorcycle accident, uh, not wearing a helmet. But fortunately, from here up, he is, is okay. It's the rest of him that's not doing so well. Uh, so prayer, continued prayers for Mike White. Any other joys and concerns to share? All right. With that, let us go to God in prayer. And as always, we'll join together in the Lord's Prayer. Almighty Father, creator of heaven and earth, we give you first praise for you, your Son, and your Holy Spirit on this day that is truly the birthday of your church. We thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit and how your word spread and your church grew and how it survived during times of tribulation, how it survived during times of corruption, how it uh, went through times of revival and growth. And Lord, now as we look at your church today, we are in desperate need of your Holy Spirit. Lord, let us here today be open to your word, to your presence, and to the power of your Holy Spirit and how life-changing that it can be. Lord, uh, we need growth and renewal, and we ask that you let it start with us here in Cleves, Ohio. Lord, uh, we lift many different people up to you today, those who are mourning the loss of loved ones, those who are dealing with tragedy in their life. Lord, our, our country just in itself is full of tragedy full of broken people that need your love, that need to feel that embrace and that acceptance of being a child of God, not the acceptance of what the world defines as accepting. And Lord, uh, uh, our, our world, whether it's in Ukraine or Uganda or other places around the world, we know that our Christian faith is in battle. Lord, every day there are people who are being martyred for their faith. And Lord, we lift them up and give them to you. And may their deeds truly be rewarded for their faith. Lord, uh, as we come to you, we also give you great joy for the many blessings uh, that you have given us. 
We thank you for great times of joy. We thank you for the beauty of summer and the sunshine. Uh, we thank you uh, that uh, despite our dysfunction, that we have the freedom that we have, that today we can gather uh, without fear or, 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 or being concerned about what people will say because we have faith in you and your holy word and let us continue to remain strong for our faith and our freedom of our faith. Lord, as we come together as your people, we recognize not only what your son did for us on the cross, but we remember the things that he taught us of how to live, how to love, and how to pray. And together we say this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now hear the word of God. This morning's scripture readings begin in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9, and Ephesians 5, verse 21 through uh, chapter 6, verse 4. Hear the words from Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Hear the words from Ephesians. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit, to, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should, should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on this earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now will the ushers please come forward for the offering.
Heavenly God, we stand before you humbly. We stand before you knowing how great you are, how wonderful and loving you are, how you have given to us each and every day. You give to us through the presence of your Holy Spirit. You give to us through the power of the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, each and every day there are blessings that happen around us that all too often we take for granted. But we have set aside this time of worship to recenter ourselves, to bring us closer to your presence, to be equipped, to be nourished, to be renewed, to be ready to serve. Lord, today we give you these tithes and offerings. Lord, we ask you to receive them and the heart by which they have been given. Lord, may they truly be used to further your kingdom. All of this we ask and pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please remain standing for our next hymn, 445, Happy Be the Home When God Is There. seated. We are nearing the end as we are in the seventh of our ninth week of our study into the book of Ephesians, which means I need to get the next sermon series planned out, right Martha? <laughs> we have covered a lot of ground in the previous six weeks. We started with Jesus as our cornerstone and we have built our foundation by looking at our individual lives and our lives as the church. And this week we look at the family. Now that looks like a normal happy family, doesn't it? But as happy as everyone appears to be, you may never guess the amount of dysfunction that goes on in our house. Yes, yeah, some of you, uh, you know, we are no different than any other families. We have our moments of chaos. We have our loud moments and sad moments and other moments when no one is smiling. And then we had moments like the other day when dad forgot to take the wheel chalk off of the trailer and drove off and tore the fender off and had some very colorful moments. But we turned it into a teaching moment to Ethan that the driver is always responsible. But looking at this picture, you would never guess that there is a varied history of family and extended family with broken homes and broken lives. And while a picture may be worth a thousand words, a picture certainly doesn't tell the whole story. 
Now, don't get me wrong. We have a great family, but we're far from being the perfect family that we try to portray in those family pictures. And all across America, it's getting harder and harder to define what a traditional family is. More and more, we have become blended families, whether it is through divorce, remarriage, or adoption. Some families continue to be extended generational families that maintain close ties, while other families live on their own miles and miles away from their closest relatives. And maybe they're not only distant by miles, but they become distant emotionally. Many families create extended families when friendships with other families become stronger and stronger. But no matter how you define family, God has set a certain standards by which our families should live. It should be our goal as a church to encourage each of our families to live according to biblical standards. This means we do our own best to hold our own families accountable first. That we should teach our children about God's standards and then turn out to help other families grow closer to God by our example. Going to the scriptures, we see that Paul writes this in Ephesians 5. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to the husbands and everything. Now ladies, please do not throw anything at me. And especially Carla. I used to think that talking about money was one of the hardest subjects to speak on. But this verse is perhaps one of the most difficult because it can be troubling for many. Because of two words, wives submit. Now just as all of us must submit to Jesus as head of the church, Paul's teaching here says that the man should be the head of the house and that the wives should submit to their husbands. And some of you are saying, really? I mean, we do live in a world of equality, or at least more equal than it used to be. A world when more and more women are becoming CEOs. More and more women are becoming millionaires. Women have become astronauts and governors and prime ministers, fed chairman and vice president of the United States. Women have broken barrier after barrier. And Paul says, what? Wives, submit. Isn't this antiquated? Isn't this misrepresented? Isn't this sexist? Why? What's the point? And I know there are many women that are saying, I will not be under the control of any man. And I know that's true because I married one. <clears throat> <clears throat> Some women say, I don't have to answer to any man. But do you see the key word in those two phrases is I. The problem with living according to God usually starts with the word I. Being a true Christian means that we deny ourselves, that we take the I out of it, and we say yes to God. Verse 22 said, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. See, the key phrase is, as you do to the Lord. Remember that Jesus taught us by washing the feet of the disciples that to become first in the eyes of God, we must do what? We must become servants. Twice in the book of Mark, Jesus tells his disciples that in order to become the greatest, that the one must become servant to all. To become first, you must become last. By making yourself last, you're making yourself greater. 
In a moment, I'm going to explain why this verse, submit, should not bother anyone. So get me, let me get to that. But here's what is important. In no uncertain terms does this mean a woman should become a doormat or treated as anything less. Because men for centuries have misused and abused this passage to create a sincere disadvantage for women. A truly healthy marriage will have proper balance. And whether it is work or school or sports, we need to be sure that there is a level playing field. So we don't want to take this out of context and push it into other areas of our lives that it does not apply. But in all reality, this passage should not be a problem for women, especially if men are being the men that God called them to be. So let's move on to the men for a moment, okay? It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or in any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Just as Christ did. Christ gave himself up, his life, his body, his blood. Christ gave up everything as a sacrifice for the church. And despite our sin and brokenness, despite how unworthy we are, Jesus used his sacrifice to make us worthy, to lift us up to a status worthy of being presented to God. And we as men are called to so love our wives unconditionally, to give everything we have for them, and despite any shortcomings they may have, we are to lift them up through the word. Verse 28 says, In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. So if we as men are doing our part, it's not really about being in control or being in charge, is it? It's about taking a back seat and making a sacrifice. It says, Jesus is saying, if you love your wife, you submit to her through your sacrifice. Do you see that? We're both being called to submission. Do you see what a great circle that makes? A wife submits to her husband who is sacrificing and submitting to her who is submitting to him as he is submitting to her, and so on. In other words, they're saying, I love you so much that I'm going to forget about what I want and work to meet your needs. And the other spouse says, no, I love you so much, I'm going to forget about what I want, and I'm going to work to meet your needs. And what happens? What happens in that case? We start to get back to what God designed our marriages to be. Verse 31 says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. You see, this verse in Ephesians is a quote from Genesis. And this is at the time of creation. Genesis 2, God says, That is why a man leaves his father and mother, and it's united to his wife, and they become one flesh. This again was quoted and affirmed by Jesus, Mark 10 Verse 5, Jesus replied, But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they know are longer two, but one. And Paul repeats it. We just read it. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother, and the two will be united, and they will become one flesh. Two become one. 
The two are to become one. It sounds more like we were originally designed for equality, doesn't it? But you see, the fall of man changed things. In Genesis 3.16, it says, To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to your children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And although Paul says that woman should still submit, we have to go back to what Jesus taught, and Jesus changed that role forever. You see, Jesus brings back equality. Because not only are we calling for the woman to serve her husband, but he calls for the man to serve his wife. By living out our roles as we read in the word through mutual submission, mutual submission, we bring back equality and unity in our relationships. It doesn't sound so bad anymore, does it? When we have healthy marriages with healthy boundaries, we set a healthy example to set for our children. It's no longer about who's in control or who's not in control. It's about a setting example of being servants of Jesus Christ first and servants of each other next. I don't know if you were ever taught in Sunday school, joy means Jesus, others, you. I say lop off the why. Because every time you bring me into the equation, it becomes a problem. You serve God with all your heart. And then what was the second commandment? To love others. Never did he say there's a third commandment, then take care of yourself. When we have our priorities right, and we love God, and we love our spouses then we don't have to worry about submitting and serving and who's in charge. It's the great equalizer. Jesus' love is a great equalizer. And when we set that example for our children, when we are getting it right, it's much easier for our children to get it right. Because isn't that the example we should be setting for our children? They should see how we love each other and how we love God. Because I can tell you with all honesty, if it was not for our faith in God, she would not be sitting here today. It would have been easy for us a long time ago to say, I need this, and I don't need that. But it was our faith that has kept us together. And if we can't live in a godly, submissive manner, how do we expect our children to? And now we move to our children. There's only three of you here today, but actually we're all still children, aren't we? Verse 6, 1, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. The first commandment with a promise. Paul was quoting Deuteronomy 5. In Deuteronomy 5, we have the Ten Commandments, and the fifth commandment is the first commandment that comes with a promise. It says, Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. God has a promise for us. Whether you are living with your mom and dad or your grandma or your grandpa or adopted parents or step-parents, God makes us a promise. He promises to bless us for our obedience. And this commandment doesn't end when we become adults. Having honor for our parents is a lifelong effort. And despite our parents' faults and imperfections, we are to honor them. And I know for those that who have suffered abuse and broken homes, this can be a very difficult proposition. And I don't want to downplay this or make it sound it's, that it's as easy as it is written. 
Because for many people, it might take serious professional counseling to deal with the things that happened to you as a child. And if this is the case, I encourage you to seek help. But for anyone that has children or planning to have children, we need to talk to them. And we need to teach them to handle their relationships with their spouse and their children in a godly manner. And it goes on to teach parents in Ephesians 6, 4, it says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Perhaps a better way to say this is don't abuse your children. Don't push them or be so hard on them that you drive them away in anger. This does not mean we don't use discipline. This does not mean we stop if they get upset. This means we must use patience, fairness, and the love of Christ when dealing in discipline and punishment. Remember those old bracelets, the WWJD? What would Jesus do? Jesus would use patience, fairness, and love. Jesus would turn to the scripture. Jesus would require accountability, the part that most people forget about. Jesus would require accountability. Jesus would bless those who are obedient and allow judgment on those who were not. We as parents must raise our children in a Christian manner. And whenever possible, we need to help influence our children and our grandchildren. Which means that together as a church, we are responsible. Like when we baptize babies, we have a responsibility to help raise them in a manner that leads them to Christ. Our Old Testament lesson was from Deuteronomy chapter 6. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We heard this before, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you to you today are to be on your hearts. But this is where we often leave out. Verse 7, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. See, if we love the Lord, our God, with all our heart and all our soul, with all our strength, then we will have Jesus as the cornerstone of our life. We will have a foundation built on biblical teachings. Our lives will shine as examples. Our children should see us reading, studying, and sharing the faith. And they should see us treating our spouses with love, respect, and submission. And then as we teach them the word of God, they will begin to see God's words in action. And if we don't live it in our lives, and if we don't teach it to our kids... How do we ever expect to get it right in the church? Being a Christian isn't just a Sunday activity. Sunday should be the highlight of our Christian lives. Sundays are when we gather with our families to worship God, to be equipped to take the teachings of God with him and use them at home to raise Christian households and to be a witness to others. And as we start to employ these principles we're learning out of the book of Ephesians, we become better Christians. We become better spouses. We become better parents. We become better families. And because of that, we become a better church. And then not only do we sustain the church by creating generations of Christian households, we become a witness to our neighbors. They see our families going to church. They see us staying together. They see us loving through our problems. And through our witness as Christians, through our witness of our lives, they will desire to have what we have. When other people desire what we have, then will we begin to add numbers to our church as we see the body 
of Christ grow. And this is not something that we just do by accident. And this is not something easy to do when we're doing it on our own. Because just like when I made that mistake this week, I was mad. I had a problem. I wanted to blame somebody else. But you see, that was the problem. I, I, I. Instead of stopping and praying and stopping and setting the example, I set a poor example. We all make mistakes because when we do it on our own, no matter how good we are, no matter what role we are, even as a pastor, we make mistakes. But because we live by the Holy Spirit, he continues to talk to us and he said, you're doing it wrong. And he even sent somebody to say, you're doing it wrong. He didn't really say you were doing it wrong, but he made his presence known that I knew I was doing it wrong. Because we pulled over into the parking lot of another church and their pastor came out and said, is there a problem here? <laughs> and I said, I've got it. It's all good. And I had to say, why did you have to send another pastor to correct the pastor? <laughs> <laughs> but you see, we can't do it on our strength. Today is a day we celebrate Pentecost Sunday. When the Holy Spirit came upon God's people and they went and did great and amazing things. Peter, who was a fisherman. Peter, who denied Christ. Peter, who made mistake after mistake after mistake, was endowed with such power that when he preached, thousands of people came to know Christ. Thousands of people who did not speak his language could hear him preaching in their language. Peter was so powerful that when his shadow passed over people who were ill, they become healed. Peter himself even raised a young girl from death. Because of Peter? No. Because he had the power of the Holy Spirit. That power of the Holy Spirit was not promised to just 11 men. That power of the Holy Spirit became on the men and the women in that presence. And it was given, as Christ said, to all believers who would follow. But you see, we've lost our way. And we've gotten away from the Holy Spirit. We've done things our way, on our schedule, and on our time. And it's time we get away from that. It is time that we come and ask God to endow us with the power of the Holy Spirit. It is time for us to receive it and claim it and grab it and live it. Because I don't know about you, I'm tired of the same old church. I'm not talking about age, Bob. I'm talking about the same old church that we've seen year after year after year after year. When we refine and rediscover that Holy Spirit, we will no longer be a shrinking church because the power of the Holy Spirit is greater than us. And I'm going to preach it and preach it and preach it until you get it. And then we're going to preach it some more. It is only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we will begin to change ourselves and change this community. And when we change this community, then we can change this county. And when we change this county, then we can change the state of Ohio. We can change our conference. We can change our denomination. We can change things, but it is only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can do that. And today we get a share in a very special gift. Where through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can experience the actual presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. That we can come together and say, God, I surrender who I am. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. 
Fill me with your son, Jesus Christ. Fill me with your love and your power. But you've got to want it. And we've got to stop saying I. We've got to stop, start saying you. And when we start serving him, and we start serving each other, things will change. Because a lot of us came here today for us. It's good to come to get revived. It's good to come to get nourishment. But did you come to worship God? Or did you come because you wanted something from God? Because that changes things. Because God deserves us to be here to worship Him. But He's also promised to bless us in return. He's also promised to feed us with the bread of life, the bread of his word, to give us a drink of nourishment that we'll never thirst again. Today we get to celebrate Holy Communion. Today can be that turning point, that pivotal point where some of you say, all right, God, I've had enough beating. The preacher said it enough. I give up. I give it to you. I submit to you. And today I receive who you are. And I receive the mission that you have for me. Whatever that calling is, without hesitation, lead me, equip me, and guide me. Today we can leave here a different church than when we came in. the night that Jesus was going to be arrested he sat down for what was going to be a celebration a great feast of thanksgiving a feast of freedom a feast of God's people being redeemed and Jesus redirected them and he took a loaf he gave thanks to God because he always put God first. And then he broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples who did not yet understand, but they would later. When he said, this is my body broken for you. I'm going to be the sacrifice that you need. I'm going to lay down my life, my body, so that you can one day be a redeemed child of God. And then Jesus took the cup. And again, he gave thanks to God. And he said, drink from this, all of you. Remember, that all included Judas, included Peter, included Thomas, included all that would abandon him. But he said, drink from all of this. This is the blood of the new covenant. And what he really meant was this is the fulfillment of God's original covenant covenant not just for the people of Israel but for the whole world for the forgiveness of sins because Jesus knew that the law in itself was not enough to make us worthy Jesus knew that we needed a change in our hearts he knew that we needed to be cleansed to be worthy to be God's children he said, drink from this, all of you, for the forgiveness of sins. Of all sins, for all time, for all 
who are willing to confess them to the Lord and repent and turn to him. And it is his promise that we will be forgiven. Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, today we not only remember this holy table, but we remember the gift that you gave to the church through your Holy Spirit to be the advocate, to be your presence with us, to teach us all the things that Jesus taught us, to lead us and guide us in every way, to fill us, to renew us, and to transform us. But in order for that to happen, Lord, we know we need to let go. We have to submit first to you. And that means bringing our sins to you, Lord. And Lord, today we confess those sins to you. Lord, we ask your forgiveness for the times that we have broken your laws and your commands. Lord, we ask for forgiveness for the times that we have refused to serve the way you have called us to serve. Lord, we come to you and ask for forgiveness for even the thoughts in our heads that have been impure and unright, for our moments of anger and jealousy and envy, for our moments of selfishness, And Lord, not only forgive us for what we have done, but forgive us for the things that we have left undone. Forgive us for the days we have not given you a thought. Forgive us for the days we have not chewed on your word. Forgive us for the days that we have gone by and not talked to you. And Lord, today now, each of us spend a few moments in silent confession. Your word, Lord, teaches us that you are faithful and just and that you will forgive us. And Lord, through your presence and the power of your Holy Spirit, I pronounce all those who have earnestly repented to be forgiven. Lord, let us continue to feel the presence of your Holy Spirit. Amen. As we continue in this service, I will bless the elements and the servers will come forward. All who wish to receive communion are welcome. If you would like the elements separately, we have separate cups. Uh, I'll give you a piece of bread and a cup. And if you want to spend as much time as you want here at the altar talking to God, maybe correcting some things that aren't right, maybe submitting to that call, Maybe swallowing some pride and saying, God, give me the strength to make that phone call when I get out of here. To call that person I need to be right with. To call that person who needs to be back in our seats. To let them know that we made mistakes, but we love them. And we want them to have the same faith, the same joy, and the same blessing that comes with truly knowing Jesus Christ and having the Holy Spirit dwelling in our lives. Lord, we ask your presence to be among these elements. We ask through your Holy Spirit that they truly become for us the body and the blood of Jesus Christ so that we as your church may become the body of Christ redeemed by his blood for the transformation of this world. Lord, may each of us truly have a Holy Spirit encounter today. This we ask and pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, those who will be serving communion, please come forward.
God's table is open. Come and receive. Let's join now in the closing hymn, number 454, Open My Eyes That I May See. Please stand. As we prepare here to leave, uh, if you have any questions or concerns about annual conference, you're welcome to catch me after the service or any time throughout the week or the weeks to come. Uh, but I promise we will have some community forums that are set aside from our worship service to talk about those things in an open, respectful, and healthy manner. Uh, but let today not be about church or politics. Let today be about being right with God. And it is only through the power of the Holy Spirit 
and His Son, Jesus Christ, can we be made right with God. Let us leave here changed because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. No matter how old your kids are or how young your kids are, how old your parents are, we still have a calling to honor, to love, to discipline, to submit, to, to follow God's commands in every way. So let us live and go as Jesus commanded. Let us love as Jesus loved. Let us serve as Jesus served. Let us go now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of his Holy Spirit. Amen.